When we look back through time, we see many avenues of evolution that we consider strange, for we do not tend to see such things in our day-to-day -day lives. However, strange is what life is all about. Trying new things, getting to know the environment, striving to reach the top rungs of the jungle gym of life. The Mesozoic and all the different forms of dinosaurs were no different, and they produced their fair share of oddities, one of which had a spectacular protrusion from its neck, the bitter reptile from La Amarga, Amargasaurus. During the early Cretaceous, the planet was teeming with all sorts of weird animals, and not only was South America no exception, it was host to bounties of strange animals seen nowhere else in the world due to its isolated nature at the time. You've got anything from sauropods with ankylosaur armor, giant allosauroids that hunted the largest animals to ever walk the planet, even two short-muzzled theropods that looked like their faces got smashed in by a car. At this point in time, titanosaur forms were fast becoming the dominant group of sauropods on the planet, but down in Gondwana, diplodocoids still held some ground, with the early Cretaceous of Argentina hosting the last of the diplodocids, Lion Cupol, Laticata, and the extremely derived grazing Rabachisaurids. One unique group distinct from these was the Dicreosaurids, a group of small diplodocoids most well known by their uncharacteristically short necks and small size. This group included the extremely short-necked Brachytrachelopon and the somewhat controversial Morrison species Suwasia. However, the last of this group was by far one of the weirdest. Directed by Argentine paleontologist Jose Bonaparte, the National Geographic Society funded the Jurassic and Cretaceous Terrestrial Vertebrates of South America project back in 1975 to help fill in the gaps in the understanding of the region's Jurassic and Cretaceous tetrapod fauna. On the seventh trip of the study in February of 1984, Guillermo Rougier found a lone skeleton. During the same expedition, almost all of the skeletal components of the horned theropod Carnotaurus were also discovered. The location of the find of the sauropod skeleton by Rougier was about 70 kilometers or 43 miles south of Zapala in the La Amarga Arroyo in the Pecun Lufiu district of Neoquen province in northern Patagonia. The skeleton was excavated, prepared in the field, jacketed, and taken back to the collections of the Bernardino Rivadavia Natural Sciences Museum in Buenos Aires. This oddly short-necked skeleton of a long-necked dinosaur was rather reasonably complete, even including a partial skull. Sauropod skulls are generally rare finds, with this sauropod skull being only the second found from the short-necked dicreosaurid group. Major parts of the whole skeleton were also found in their original anatomical positions. In other words, everything was connected or at least aligned in the same way it was when the animal died. That fits with how well preserved the skeleton was, and how much of that skeleton there was. Something happened to the body during burial that prevented it from being pulled apart and scattered by the elements. Getting back to that skull, only the temporal bone and the brain case have been found to be in quite good condition. The sacrum, or the bit that connects the hip bones to the hip vertebrae, was somewhat eroded before burial, but is still mostly intact. Three front, three middle, and one back vertebrae, as well as parts of numerous more, are all that remain of the tail. The scapula or shoulder blade and coracoid or chest bone that rests in between the shoulder blades and on the front of the chest are the only bones that are specifically associated with the shoulder girdle, whereas the ilium, the uppermost bone of the pelvis, is the only bone that is specifically associated with the pelvis. The arms and legs are similarly dismembered, with the hand and most of the foot gone. This specimen would not see official description and publication until 1991, but it saw a name quite a bit before that. In fact, it got a name right when it was discovered. 
Jose Bonaparte was an Argentine paleontologist who discovered a plethora of South American dinosaurs and mentored a new generation of Argentine paleontologists. One of the best known Argentine paleontologists, he has been described by paleontologist Peter Dodson as almost single handedly responsible for Argentina becoming the sixth country in the world in kinds of dinosaurs. He was the first to give this unique sauropod the name Amargosaurus, meaning reptile from La Amarga, in reference to the site of the discovery of the specimen, specimen MACNN15. The first and unofficial mention of Amargosaurus was published by Bonaparte in the 1984 Italian book Solie Orme Dei Dinosauri. Initially, the species was named Armargosaurus groberi in honor of Pablo Grober. However, in the official description published a few years later, this was altered to Armargosaurus kezawai. In 1991, Leonardo Salgado and Bonaparte published the formal description of the species in the Argentine scientific journal Ameginiana. The La Amarga Arroyo is a significant part of the story, thus it's fitting that this dinosaur was given the name Amargosaurus. The geological formation where the bones were discovered is called La Amarga, which is also the name of a local town. Amargo means bitter in Spanish. This single species was named after a geologist who worked for the state-owned YPF oil firm. The skeleton was discovered in 1983 after Cazal briefed Bonaparte's team about the La Amarga Formation's paleontological importance. A further publication describing the skull was released by Salgado and Jorge O. Calvo a year later. Taxonomy Amargosaurus has been found quite stably to be a part of the short-necked sauropod family Dicreosauridae a family that is ranked among the usually long-necked Diplodacoidea. Currently, the Dicreosauridae group contains about nine species that belong to eight genera. The most recently discovered is Lingulong Shenchai from the early or mid-Jurassic period of China. Lingulong is currently the largest known of this family and came fully loaded with a tall humped back. The smallest and shortest neck of the group is Brachytrachelopon mesai from late Jurassic Argentina. This thing is so bizarre that I don't even want to get into it in this video. Suwasia emilie is another, though it is unusual for the group in having a longer neck and more traditionally diplodocoid proportions. Suwasia comes from the Jurassic Morrison formation of the US. Then there is Dicreosaurus, the one for which the group was named. Dicreosaurus was to Dicreosauridae as Diplodocus and its closest relatives were to the greater Diplodocoidea. In other words, though Dicreosaurus was more like the other Diplodocoids, it definitely did have a shorter, stockier anatomy and was stockier than its relative Suwasia. There are two known species, Dicreosaurus settleri and Dicreosaurus hansemani, from the Tendaguru beds of Tanzania. Amargosaurus is the first of this group to be found from Cretaceous rocks, and it was followed by the fragmentary short-spined Pelmatuya fondesi, the super-fragmentary Amarga titanus magni, and the fragmentary but intriguing reverse unocard Bahadosaurus pronuspinax of Argentina. Others have been placed in this group to various reasons and to various degrees of validity, like the late Jurassic Smetanosaurus of Colorado, the late Jurassic Dislocosaurus of Wyoming, and the late Jurassic Dystrophaeus of Utah, though this one is the most tentative and is regarded by most experts as a nomen dubium, a specimen so fragmentary as to be near useless to name, literally being a dubious name. An unnamed specimen of Dicreosaurid is also known from early Cretaceous rocks of Brazil, suggesting the group had an enormous range in time and space that has only had its surface etched. Most analyses have found that Dicreosaurus and Brachytrachelopon are most closely related to each other than either are to Amargosaurus, but that all three form a close grouping. Pilmatuya and Bahadosaurus, despite being spiny-necked sauropods, seemed to have split from the tree that led to the Dicreosaurus Brachytrachelopon Amargosaurus group earlier. 
This should tell you that long spines evolved multiple times and possibly for multiple reasons among the Dicreosauridae. Meanwhile, most work on the group has found that the long-necked Suasia is the most basal member of the group, which lines up with its less derived features. Together with the Diplodocidae and the Robachisauridae, the Dicreosauridae is nested inside the Diplodocoidea. All members of the Diplodocoidea are characterized by their boxed-shaped snout and narrow teeth restricted to the foremost portion of the jaws. Both the Dicreosauridae and the Diplodocidae are characterized by bifurcated neural spines of the neck and back vertebrae. In the Dicreosauridae, the bifurcated neural spines were strongly elongated, a trend reaching its extreme in Amargosaurus and Bahadasaurus, at least as far as is known. One of the many reasons as to why Amargosaurus is unusual amongst sauropods is the preservation of the part of the skull. See, with sauropods, you got yourself an animal whose remains do not like the fossilization process. The animals were made up of hollow, suspension beam-like bones of incredible size, topped with a proportionally incredibly small head. When such massive animals die, they are usually the feeding grounds for tons of animals, just as dead whales are to the critters of the ocean. Therefore, there are so many environmental things that can tear apart a sauropod carcass and scatter every single piece to the farthest reaches of the land. This process means that nearly all sauropod species do not have preserved skulls. Only the shape of the skulls is known for some sauropods due to finding more than one of the same animal, and even that is a one in a million chance, which is when I come back to Amargosaurus. The remains of Amargosaurus included a partial skull. Since there is a basic idea of the skull shape of Diplodocids, the entire shape of the skull of Amargosaurus can be accurately judged. Its skull was long and thin, like a horse, but the end of the snout got bigger at the end with a rounded tip, the better for biting through foliage, stripping it of its leaves with its long, peg-like teeth. The remains of Amargosaurus found were quite remarkable for many reasons. Amargosaurus stands out from the other members of its family, as well as most sauropods in general, quite obviously, due to the long extended spines delicately erupting out from its broad neck. These spines start at the very first neck vertebrae and don't technically stop till near the halfway point of the tail. The neck spines are what is considered bifurcated, which really just means that there are two of them side by side, symmetrically aligned. They also bend backwards over the vertebrae behind it and end in rounded tips. As you go down the neck and trunk of the animal's body, you'll see that the spines shrink and become placed closer together until it reaches the first couple of vertebrae after the hip vertebrae, at which point a new type of neural spine replaces the fragile thin spikes of the neck. The neck spines are replaced with a paddle-shaped projection of the vertebrae, creating a ridge going down the animal's back towards the end of the tail. Spines those spines sure are something, huh? Like, what the hell were these weirdos doing with them? That is such a thick topic that I bet you will wish you hadn't asked. The precise appearance and use of those spines have remained tauntingly elusive. The major and obvious reason for this is because there are no known terrestrial vertebrate animals alive today that have this precise feature. Sure, there are some reptiles that have crests, wattles, sails, or humps, but the bones of these structures don't resemble the Amargosaurus spines particularly well. Oddly enough, some spines that make up the sails of some chameleons look a lot more like the spines of Spinosaurus than Amargosaurus. On top of that, there is only one specimen of Amargosaurus known. Imagine if those paleontologists only found the parts of the skeleton that had been missing the spines. The understanding of what it looked like would be so, so off. Salgado and Bonaparte threw out some suggestions for the appearance and use of these spines back when they published their description of the skeleton in 1991. Their suggestions included that the spines may have been used as defensive weapons against predators. They taper at their tips after all, or that they could have used these spines as a display feature for friends and foes. 
when the animal was alive, did the spines just stick out like sore uh, spines? Or were they encased in thin skin like the sails of many reptiles? Or were they the understructure for big meaty muscles? Or even the support for fat deposits? Gregory S. Paul, world-renowned paleoartist, author, and amateur paleontologist, threw out some ideas in 1994. He considered the possibility that the skin sails that some paleoartists had reconstructed the animal with were possibly unlikely, as a pair of skin neck sails would have likely reduced flexing of the neck down or up to eat or drink. Paul also noted that the spines themselves were circular in cross-section, rather than flat as is the case in the spines of animals alive today that have skin sails, like those chameleons I mentioned earlier. Even the neural spines of the bison, a known humpbacked animal, are tall and paddle-shaped and flat from side to side. Paul therefore argued that the shape of the spines would better fit that of a rod of bone that supported a sheath of keratin that extended the full length of the spine a great deal when the animal was alive. In this case, the spines would have acted as a visual display to friends and foes and as a defensive weapon against predators who tried to bite down on the neck from above or simply to look bigger and harder to kill. The neck, now no longer tied up by skin sails, could have bent down and presented any would-be attackers with a bush or fence of forward-pointing spines. Youch! That does not seem appetizing, unless you're pinhead, I guess. It's a waste of good suffering. Paul, furthermore, hypothesized the animal may have been capable of shaking these spines together to produce a clattering sound as a form of communication. Regardless of the truth of any of this, I quite like the artistic stereotype of an animal shaking some noisy structure on its body to any approaching animals. Interestingly enough, keratin-covered spines were included with the skeletal reconstruction provided in a 1999 publication by Salgado. Then, in 1997, paleontologist Jack Bailey published a paper on the possible use and appearance of these spines. He argued that the spines were remarkably similar to those found sprouting from the back of pelicosaurs, like Dimetrodon. According to Bailey, this may suggest that Amargosaurus also possessed a sail of skin on its neck for display. If you couldn't tell, the biggest difference here is that Amargosaurus has two rows of spines, while Dimetrodon only had one. Since there wasn't much room between these two rows of spines, about just 3 to 7 centimeters or 1.2 to 2.8 inches, the existence of two separate parallel rows of skin sails seems a tad unlikely. So, Bailey suggested the Amargosaurus spines were a scaffolding for a huge block of skin that encased both rows of spines, the neural spines from the second to last back vertebra all the way to the first tail vertebra. The neural spines from the second to last back vertebra all the way to the first tail vertebra, though tall, were shaped entirely differently from those of the neck and torso. These spines were paddle-shaped, like in Spinosaurus or bison, but turned so that the flat paddle part faced forwards rather than out to the sides. The thin blade parts stuck out side to side. These may have been formed in a similar way to the bifurcated spines of the front half of the animal in that there are two spines, but in these vertebrae they fuse together and expand outwards, forming this paddle shape that is usually a single neural spine in other animals. According to Bailey, these paddle-shaped spines resembled those of modern bison enough to indicate that this area of the animal may have been similarly humped. Bailey also suggested that this is the same sort of structure you see in other dinosaurs, namely Spinosaurus and Oranosaurus, meaning that they all had humps. Future studies would prove this to be inaccurate or at the very least too simple. I would chastise past Bailey here only in that comparison he made. Though these bones are shaped similarly, they are clearly in a different position here in Amargosaurus and composed differently being fused of bifurcated spines rather than a tall sail-like singular neural spine. In 2007, another paper was published, this time on the Dicreosauridae as a whole. 
The author team, Daniela Schwartz, Eberhard Frey, and Christian Mayer, sought to reconstruct the pneumatic diverticula, ligaments, and muscles in the necks of both the Dicreosauridae and Diplodocidae. These structures together compose the animal's axial soft tissue system, and reconstructing it helps to better understand their biology. Their research concluded that both of these dinosaur groups had bifurcated neural spines that enclosed an air sac that connected to the lungs as an extensive respiratory system. A 2022 paper by D. Carey Woodruff, Ewan Wolf, Matt Waddell, Sophie Dennison, and Larry Whitmer found further evidence of this extensive air sac system throughout the necks of sauropods in the infected neck bones of a diplodocid. The respiratory infection left behind some scars that only a respiratory infection could have, further proving that they had these extensive air sacs throughout their neck bones. With regard to the 2007 Schwartz and colleagues paper, the air sac of Dicreosaurus itself, a medium-sized, medium-neck-lengthed member of the group that did not have super-tall spiny neural spines, would have rested along the neural arch and filled up the entire breadth of the space between the neck spines. Dicreosaurus had bifurcated neck spines that gave its neck a taller side profile. They just weren't super tall, super skinny, or super pointy as in Amargosaurus. According to the work of Schwarz and colleagues, in Amargosaurus, the upper two-thirds of the spines would have been covered in a keratin sheath, while the bottom part would have been where the air sac fit in. Their reasoning for the keratin sheath only on two-thirds of the spine was that striations in the bone were only present on the end two-thirds of the spines. Striations in the bone are present in the bony horn cores of most modern horned terrestrial vertebrates, so the reasoning is somewhat sound. I say somewhat because dinosaurs were a tad weird in special ways, so it cannot be said without a shadow of a doubt unless a specimen of Amargosaurus is found with a keratin sheath preserved on the outside of its spines, something that is difficult to impossible to occur in sauropods due to their size. Though these striations could also be indication of the presence of a skin covering, though I personally, subjectively, doubt that here in this animal. In their 2016 Johns Hopkins University Press Tome, The Sauropod Dinosaurs, Life in the Age of Giants, paleontologist Matt Waddell and paleoartist Mark Hallett did some speculation on Amargosaurus based on observations Waddell had made of the fossils. They hypothesized that the backswept spines may have been able to skewer predators if the animal slammed its mohawk backwards during an attack. The reasoning, beyond the general flexibility of the neck bones and the stabby stabbiness of the spines, is that modern sable antelope and Arabian oryx do this, though they only have a single pair of awfully long horns coming out of the back of their skull. Hallett and Waddell went further, suggesting that rival males may have interlocked their spines for neck wrestling, though this sounds awfully painful to me. Along came another close relative to Amargosaurus in 2019, when Pablo Galina, Sebastian Apesteguia, Juan Canale, and Alejandro Halusa published their description of Bahadasaurus, known from just a few neck and skull bones. Bahadasaurus also had long, thin, bifurcated neural spines sticking out of its neck. However, its spines arched forward rather than backwards. Galena and team suggested both animals used their spines for defense and had them both reconstructed with free spines rather than skin or muscle or sac encased sails or humps. The defensive function hypothesis seems to have been more fitting for Bajatosaurus than Amargosaurus, since the forward projecting neck spines would have more easily formed a defensive fence of spines when the animal bent its neck down. The farthest tips of Bahadasaurus's spines may have well passed the head, covering it from immediate damage. This would be a great passive defense when the animal was grazing low to the ground or drinking. It would not need to keep its eyes out for danger as much. If the keratinous sheath covered the ends of the spines, as suggested by plenty of researchers and inferred from bone texture, then the length of the spines in this animal could well have been 50% longer in life. However, what the authors of the Bahadasaurus study and a lot of Amargosaurus researchers have not considered is that the neural spines may have just been a tad too fragile to perform under defensive stresses. They were the neural spines. 
If they snapped or cracked and took their bony bases with them, the animal's spinal cord would have been damaged. I don't know if I have to bring this up, but if your cord is cut, you're done. Or at least anything past the point it was cut is done. Extra oof. Extra yikes from me, dog. The case of the mysterious neck spines came to an interesting head in 2022 with the publication of Ignacio Cerda, Fernando Novas, Jose Luis Carballido, and Leonardo Salgado's paper on their analysis of the structure, morphology, and microanatomy of the neural spines of a margosaurus and an as yet unnamed dicreosaurid that is also from the La Amarga formation. They found that the spines of these animals were most likely not covered by a keratin sheath as had been previously hypothesized by a ton of other researchers. Osteohistology, or looking at microstructures of the bones under the scope, found that they were most likely covered in a sail of skin. The spines were highly vascularized with vein marks on the outside and inside and even cyclical growth marks, all of which adds credence to this hypothesis. I did a video on this paper when it came out, so go check out that video to learn more about it. Senses and Posture In 2014, Ariana, Paulina, Carabajal, Jose Carbalito, and Phil Curry threw the Amargosaurus skull through a CT scanner to get some idea of what was going on with the inside. This allowed the generation of 3D models of the cranial endocast and the inner ear. With these models, the team found that the cranial endocast was about 94 to 95 millimeters, or 0.2 to 0.21 pints in volume, with the inner ear being 30 millimeters, or 1.2 inches tall, and 2.2 millimeters, or 0.87 inches wide. The part of the ear that contained the hair cells for hearing, the Lagina, was relatively short, which tells you that Amargosaurus had a poorer sense of hearing than other comparable sauropods. Now, all the way back in 1999, Leonardo Salgado had argued that Amargosaurus would not have been able to hold its head in a horizontal position, as in many other animals and many other sauropods. Salgado argued this was impossible because of the neural spines getting in the way. So, he argued, the head would have been in a more vertical position, but he did not have CT scan data to work with. The way in which an animal habitually holds its head is almost always reflected in the orientation of the semicircular canals of the ears, since this part of the head is responsible for the sense of balance. It's called the vestibular system. Skipping ahead to 2014, the CT scans of Amargosaurus's skull revealed the animal's inner ear and that the snout of the animal would have been neutrally faced downwards at an angle of roughly 65 degrees relative to horizontal. A similar position was even proposed for the related Diplodocus. The neutral pose for the animal's short neck can also be approximated based on how the neck vertebrae attach to one another. According to the work of Karabajal and friends, the neck would have sloped downwards so that the snout rested almost three feet off the ground at rest. Obviously, a living, breathing animal is also a moving one, so this position would not have been the position the neck and head were stuck in, nor stayed in, all the time. This is just the biologically neutral position. Locomotion Next up, we need to discuss the locomotion of Amargosaurus. This is because some researchers have argued that the animal was a bit more agile than most long-necked dinosaurs. Originally, Salgado and Bonaparte argued the animal was a curmudgeonly slowpoke ambling across the land from tree to tree. This is not particularly unusual for the long necks, as that has been the traditional assumption for the better part of 200 years. Various anatomical and computational studies have been done in that time to get a narrower and narrower concept of the speed these things were capable of attaining, to simpler or more confusing conclusions. The bigger they are, the slower they are. They are big and need a lot of muscle to move things and carrying dozens of tons of weight around just isn't feasible at high speeds. However, they were huge and did have huge muscles, so must have been able to trot very fast like how elephants can just kinda catch up to you. I would not want to bet on winning a race against an Alamosaurus. I mean, I may win, but hell if I would try. Nah, ain't for me. Ain't for me, dog. Ain't for me. 
Salgado and Bonaparte thought a Margosaurus was a slowpoke because of its proportionally short forearms and calves, a trait of large, slow animals. Seems like good enough reasoning. In 1999, however, researchers Gerardo Mazzetta and Richard Farina attempted to calculate the athletic capabilities of a Margosaurus and Carnotaurus. You see, the leg bones of an animal are strongly affected by bending movements, therefore presenting a limiting factor as to how fast an animal can go. Under this loosey-goosey rule, the researchers hypothesized that a Margosaurus was capable of going pretty fast, as its leg bones were sturdier than today's white rhino, which is fully capable of galloping across the Serengeti. Since a Margosaurus was one of the smaller sauropods and had a bunch of airy sacs running along the length of its body and was not carrying a giant 50-foot neck, I would not want to be around it when it got angry and wanted something to pound into mush or whip into flesh cream. Size Speaking of it being small, how large was this spiny beast? Allow me to bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme to get a better idea. A Margosaurus was a small sauropod. Not the smallest, but small. It was also not the smallest nor largest of its group of characteristically small sauropods, the Dicreosaurids. Based on the single specimen known to science, a Margosaurus may have reached 30 to 43 feet, 9 to 13 meters in length. It topped the scales at 2.6 to 4 tons. The animal only had a neck of about 8 feet or 2.4 meters in length. Thanks, Mr. Man. With a smaller size, what was this animal eating? Who ate it? Ecology like many late Cretaceous sauropods, this magnificent find was made in Argentina. Specifically, the specimen comes from the La Amarga formation of the La Amarga Arroyo in the Picunifu department of Neuquén province in the northern part of the Patagonian region. The rocks it was found in, part of the La Amarga formation, radiometrically date to approximately 130 to 120 million years ago which means that Amargosaurus also comes from this time, the Barremian and Aptian stages of the early Cretaceous. Most vertebrate fossils from the Amargosaurus layer were buried in rock that corresponds to a riverine ecosystem with lots of braided rivers. This is only where the Amargosaurus body ended up and ended up getting buried, so it does not reflect the environment it lived in all the time. And it very well may be that Amargosaurus preferred environments that are not conducive to fossilization, and this may be why there is only one known specimen. The specimen of Amargosaurus came from a layer that was made of sandy conglomerate rock, meaning that it may have been a tad more upstream than other animals as sediment tends to get smaller the lower the elevation you are at. Amargosaurus lived with many other animals, especially sauropods, which suggests it had a different niche to all of the other contemporary sauropods, which included Zapalosaurus and Amarga titanus, but also a whole bunch of other unnamed or poorly preserved titanosaurs. Since Amargosaurus had a neck length intermediary between the shorter necks of Zapalosaurus, which fed at ground level, and the Titanosauriforms, which were higher browsers, Amargosaurus would therefore have fed above ground level. It also lived with animals all creatively named after the exact same place, including the fragmentary Stegosaur, Amargostegos, and the Ceratosaur, Liga Bueno. I'm sure the region was also full of its fair share of invertebrate animals like bugs, spiders, scorpions, and mollusks, with all sorts of lizards, snakes, small mammals like vincelestes, turtles, and crocodiles like Amargasuchus. Comparing the other South American rock layers known, it would be highly likely some forms of abelosaurs, alvarosaurs, dromaeosaurs, and carcharodontosaurs were present too but they are either too fragmentary to name or have yet to be found. I would also not rule out small bizarre ankylosaurs like the almost unplaceable Stegoros and Jacopil. Amargosaurus was the last of its kind. The Diplodocids themselves disappeared very early in the Cretaceous, with Lion Cupal and a few unnamed Gondwan and Taxa surviving. It is unknown why Dicreosaurids and Diplodocids died off, 
perhaps the rapid proliferation of the highly specialized Rabachisaurids, as well as the increasing diversity of titanosaur forms, eventually led to a lack of niches for these families to fill, and they were left to fade out of existence. Gone, but not forgotten. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.